let's open our Bibles to the beginning today. Let's go over to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. As we continue this series, Trojan Horses of the Church Today. And uh, today, um, we are covering the issue of Bible translations. We are covering the issue of mainly corrupt, what I would call, I know that's a strong word, corrupt Bible translations. Uh, here's what I'm asking you to do today. Uh, you may be here today. You may have a different translation other than the King James. You're welcome to be here, okay? We're not going to confiscate your Bible at the door. Um, you can have that. That's your right. That's your choice. Uh, people who are watching, um, uh, I want you to, uh, all of us, I want you to three things today. Number one, listen to what I'm saying. Listen to what we're covering. Be honest about it. Be open-minded. Listen. Two, consider it. Consider it. Study it out for yourself. Okay? And then three, decide. Make the decision. We've done that. I've done that as a pastor, as a Christian. Okay? Um, uh, there's a lot of misinformation going on today on all sides of this issue, and that's one of the things that makes it such a volatile issue and one where there's literally there's civil war going on. And I'm not saying there isn't a reason for there to, to be battling in certain ways in certain issues of this, but nevertheless, I want you to keep those three things in mind as we go through. In Genesis chapter 3, it says in verse 1, Now the serpent, the devil of course, was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said. Do you see that? First thing right off the bat, Satan is trying to question the word of God. Okay, he's trying to put doubt in the minds of Adam and Eve as far as what has God said. Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, now remember, what does he begin with? Yea, hath God said. Did God really say that? So questioning the word of God, and then we have this statement, which is always where the devil's going, by the way. Ye shall not surely die. He basically is calling God a liar. Okay? He's disagreeing with God. He's going contrary to what the word of God says. Now, the human race has been tempted by Satan ever since Genesis 3.1 to question and to change the word of God. This has always been a tactic of the devil. If there was a basic and foundational place where a Trojan horse could get into the church and do damage, it would be at this fundamental basic level, yea, hath God said. What has God actually said? Okay, what exactly are his words? This is foundational. This is fundamental. And this is bigger than a lot of us have ever really thought about. I know I've been challenged in preparing this series on this, and I've had times of really uh, deep thought as far as this issue goes, because this is very fundamental, okay? Understand the seriousness of this. Many sincere people have been taught and believe that the Bible is the Word of God, okay? Okay? When you hold up a Bible, believers, Christians, or even religious, quote-unquote, Christians, okay, the Bible is the Word of God. That's been a fundamental issue of Christianity for thousands of years now, okay? The Bible's the Word of God. And so they hold up a Bible, and most people think the Bible's the Word of God, and you say, which Bible's the Word of God? Well, they're all the Word of God. Well, there's a problem, though. There's a problem. Because when two different versions of the Bible differ in what they say, and when I say differ, I'm not talking about just a synonym has changed. I'm talking about a whole thought concept has changed. A, a truth has been changed. A statement has been changed. Okay? Now we've got a contradiction. Now we have to decide which one is telling the truth. 
This breeds confusion, and this undermines the faith of people. The Bible is the final authority for faith and practice. We believe that. Most, many churches have that in their statement. Okay, um, Many statement of faiths say that exact same phrase. Now, if this is what we believe, that the Bible is the Word of God, then why wouldn't Satan want to corrupt the translation of the Bible and put false teaching into that thing that's between the leather cover? with the gold pages. In other words, get something, it looks like a Bible, all right, and maybe there's a bunch of it that is accurate, but put things in there that are actually teaching contrary to what the Bible teaches. What a, what a clever way for the devil to undermine the faith and lead people astray. Sincere people will believe it because it is in the Bible. Now, what, let, me, let me just say that again. What am I getting at? This is very, very important to understand, folks. If you have a Bible translation and it is teaching things that are contrary to the truth of Scripture, in other words, it's teaching false doctrine, but it is found in a Bible People will believe it because it's found in the Bible. Do you understand what I'm saying? So they're, they're, they're approaching the Scripture. Let's say they approach it and they go to a passage, and we're going to look at several today. They'll go to a passage and they'll read something that, biblically speaking, is false. It's been mistranslated. It's been poorly translated. And what they're reading is false according to the truth of God that we know is found in Scripture. And yet they will believe it to be true, even though they're going to wrestle with it probably their whole life. They'll believe it to be true because it's in their Bible. Do you understand how dangerous this is? I deal with this all the time with people. You probably do as well. So let me just uh, cover some things here today, because uh, you know, we live, in a, we live in a strange world today. We're living in a world where there's, a, there's an attack on people who believe or who use the King James Version of the Bible. That's what we use here in our church. We, we've, we uh, have made that choice. We have reasons why. Now, we're not going to go into a lot of, lot of detail on this because we're pressed for time today. But let me say as we go through the different points in the message today, number one, why we use the King James Version. We use the KJV, that's what I'm going to call it. We use the KJV because it is an excellent translation of the Bible. How do you know that? It has been the Bible for English-speaking people for over 400 years. That is unprecedented in the history of the church. Do you understand that is almost one-fourth of the entire history of the church age? The churches use basically one Bible, and it's been the King James. So if any Bible has been tried and proven over time, it is the King James, okay? This is an amazing truth. There was a time when you bought, if you went to buy a Bible in a Bible bookstore, remember Bible bookstores? There was a time when you went to buy a Bible that the version of the Bible, of the translation, was not even on the spine. Do you know why? Because everybody had King James Version Bibles. It wasn't that long ago, by the way, that it was that way. The King James was accepted as the truth. It was tried. It was proven. It was trusted more than any other. And remember, friends, again, it's not a light thing. This went on for hundreds and hundreds of years, unlike any translation in history. Keep that in mind. It is a translation that is true to the faith. Now, that is of utmost importance. When you read something in your King James, okay, you don't have to say, half God said, 
because that is, it is accurate, it is true to the faith. The, the, the KJV has never led anyone into false doctrine. Now, I'm not saying people haven't created false doctrines, but the translation has not led them into false doctrines. That cannot be said for a lot of Bibles today. Now, I have friends in ministry whom, I'm, whom I, I respect as, as uh, individuals who use different translations of the Bible. That is their choice. I don't consider them my, my enemies. They're, they're my friends, and um, uh, I don't consider them satanic people. I don't consider them evil people. This is a choice they've made. That's up to them. I'm just saying we use the King James. We have reason, though, to use the King James, okay? A lot of your scholarship, quote-unquote, today, if you use the King James, they kind of look at you like you're some sort of an ignorant hick from the backwoods or something. Friend, listen, there's a lot of brilliant men who stand on the King James Version of the Bible and have through hundreds of years. Great, great Minds. Not only that, but the translators of the King James were men of incredible credentials as far as translation goes. But our conviction, now this may surprise some of you, our conviction actually goes deeper than the King James translation itself. You see, we believe the foundation for Bible translation needs to be the Masoretic text of the Old Testament and the Textus Receptus or the received text of the New Testament. If I was a Bible translator today, and I would not be a Bible translator today, I don't want that responsibility. That scares me. But if I was a Bible translator today and wanted to translate the Bible into a foreign language, what, I, what would I do? I would go back and I would use the, the Masoretic text of the Old Testament and I would use the Texas Receptus of the New Testament as that foundation to do that translation work. You might say, why do you bring that up? Because there's an entire different text stream, especially for the New Testament. For most, almost, not all, but almost all new Bible translations. And we'll get to that in just a moment. Okay, so uh, here, here's what I'm saying. People say, well, um, you can't change the words of the King James. Now, let's be honest about it, okay? There are words in the King James that we don't use anymore. And for new people to get face-to-face -face with it, they do struggle with it. A lot of, lot of them do. And I understand that, and I appreciate that. These are people, maybe newly saved people, who you, you give it to them, and they say, well, I don't understand some of these words in there. I get that. I understand that. Okay? And, and there, there wouldn't be anything wrong with if you had a qualified group of men who really, really knew their stuff to uh, say, okay, you know what, let's update some of the words and then carefully, carefully, carefully do that. Okay? You might say, well, that's, that's changing the Bible. No, it really isn't changing the Bible as long as it's true to the foundation of what the King James is based on. Do you understand, folks? It's a textual issue. It's not the version issue. There was a time when there was no King James Version. But there's been the Masoretic and the Textus Receptus. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's the foundation. Now, the King James translators took that, and they took other translations that were based on that, and they carefully, carefully, carefully crafted, studied, and had committees, and they came together, and they worked through it. And what did they come up with? They came up with a magnificent translation of the Bible, true to the faith. But the King James is not the foundation the King James is a translation of the foundation of our Bible. Do you see what I'm saying? If you were going to go to another country, you wouldn't use as, as the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, foundation, you wouldn't use the King James. Now, certainly you would refer to it, but you wouldn't use that as the foundation. No, you would go back to your Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic to do that. I hope you understand what I'm saying. 
But our conviction goes deeper than the King James, although the King James is based on the true underlying text of the Bible. Turn with me, Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 5. Here's what the Bible says. It says this, every word of God is pure. Now, that, by the way, there may be some King James people who just heard what I said. You've already written me off as a heretic. Listen, friend, there is no such thing as double inspiration. Only the originals were actually literally inspired, but we have those preserved in these texts that I just mentioned, and we can use them for Bible translation. And the King James is a masterpiece as far as a translation from those things. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you understand, would you raise your hand? Okay, hopefully this is not too, too much for anybody. I, I don't think it is. I'm really trying to make this as simple as I can. Proverbs 30, verse 5, every word of God is pure. This is very important. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them to put their trust in him. If every word of God is pure, then your translation should be a word-for-word -word translation as much as possible. That is what the King James Version is. Psalm 12, verse 6, the words of the Lord. Not just the word of the Lord general. The words, the very words themselves are pure words, as silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Matthew 4, 4, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word, every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Do you understand? It's not just the concepts. Now here, this is, this is very important. I'll get to that statement in just a minute. Matthew 5, 18, uh, Jesus said, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law. These are the little marks around the characters of, of the, uh, the, uh, the Hebrew text, okay? Jots and, and tittles. God is meticulous when it comes to his word. Meticulous. God is very careful with his word. If you're going to translate, that's why I said I, I don't want to be a translator. I don't know enough about translating to even attempt that. No, thank you. I want somebody who knows what they're doing. Well, I can tell you this, the King James translators knew what they were doing. Okay, Almost 50 men coming together and working together as a team putting it together. That is one of the reasons why it's lasted so long, because it's based on the right text, and it was done by competent people who were true to the text and to the teaching of Scripture. Okay? Now, listen. There is no, and I'm being very honest with you today in what I'm saying, there is no perfect way of going from one language to another. We say as much as possible a word-for-word -word translation. That is the right statement. Because when you go from one language to another, there are just some little things you can't bring over because the language doesn't allow it. That's just the nature of it. If you study language, you, you know that. But the answer, here's the, the issue. The answer is not moving or departing from a word-for-word -word as much as possible translation, which is what you have in the King James. The answer is not moving from that to a thought-for-thought -thought translation, which is what most of your Bibles are today. It's called dynamic equivalency. So what they'll do is they'll take a truth and then they'll say, well, let's modernize it, make it easier for people to understand. And so what they come up with Actually, if you look behind the words themselves, not all of them, okay, but some of the words, you look behind those words and there really isn't any basis for that word in the Greek or Hebrew. They've put it in there just to make the reading smooth. Now listen, every word of God is pure. You don't fool around with this kind of stuff. And people will give an account to God for what they've done with his book one day. This is serious. 
But most of your Bibles coming out today are dynamic equivalents. At best, most of them are that way. And that is a very poor way of getting a Bible. Because you're, not, you're no longer going word for word. You're just saying, okay, well, let me, let me put that in other words to where people can grasp it. Wait a minute. That's not how God gave his word. He gave it word for word. He didn't give it in thoughts or concepts. He gave it in words. Every word of God is pure. I know I'm laboring this, but this is very important. Because if you start getting away from the words, there's no stopping you from drifting and going as far as you want, and you end up with things such as the message, which is a disaster. Disaster. Dynamic equivalency may be easy, but it is sloppy. It is sloppy. The very words of Scripture are inspired, not just the thoughts. This in itself is reason enough not to use most Bible versions today. Not to mention, by the way, what we have seen in the last 20 years. And by the, by the way, the reason a lot of these weird ideas are coming into Bibles nowadays is because they got away from word for word and went to dynamic equivalency. And so what do you have in Bibles today? Bibles, quote-unquote Bibles. You have gender-neutral language is in them now. You know, it's amazing. People say, well, the Bible now, the Bible now. I know the one, uh, the, the English Standard Version. That's the one. Everybody's wanting the ESV now. Do you know the ESV is full of gender-neutral language? Did you know that? Now listen, friend, what do I mean by that? Let me, let me try to cover this very quickly. Not in my notes. Let me try to cover this. When, when God gave his word, some of the words had a gender to them. Masculine, feminine, neuter. Do you understand? The words themselves that God gave have that. They come along, and instead of it being where it should be man or mankind, they'll say people. They'll be general. They will not honor what God gave them. They'll take the liberty to change it because they don't want to offend different groups of people. Years ago, when uh, uh, James Dobson was president of Focus on the Family, I remember one of the revisions of the NIV came out, and it was gender-neutral. He blew his stack, and they took it off the American market. Of course, a few years later, they put it back on. I don't know if it was after he left or, or, or what. But now, that's a common thing with the new translations coming out. There's gender-neutral gender language. Listen, if it's, if it's a neutral word, fine. But if it's masculine, keep it masculine, because that's how God gave it. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is what's going on. It is undermining the Word of God. It is not up to man to make those choices. We shouldn't be fooling around. The NIV is that way, gender neutral, the ESV, and there's many others. Listen, a translation is only as good as what it is based on, the text that it is based on, and then, how well is it translated, the text that it's based on? So, if you start with a faulty text, you're going to have a faulty translation. Even if you go word by word, if, you, if your underlying text is a false text or a corrupt text, your translation is going to have problems with it because what you're starting with, what you have to work with, is faulty to begin with. Do you understand I hope you get that. Okay, which leads us to our second point. Almost all of the modern translations today are based on the foundation of Westcott and Hort. The two men most responsible for modern alterations in the New Testament were B.F. Westcott and F.J.A. Hort. They were theological liberals, and as a matter of record, they did not like the King James Version of the Bible. Now, they were in the mid-1800s. More about that in just a moment. Well, I guess I'll mention it. Uh, 
It is not a coincidence that their work gained traction during the rise of theological liberalism in the 1800s. Theological liberalism denies the Bible is the inspired Word of God. They'll say, well, it contains the Word of God, but it isn't necessarily the Word of God, every word. They are responsible for the New Testament in the original Greek. That was, a, that was a New Testament published in 1881. Their work has been revised and updated by Germans Eberhard Nessel and Kurt Alland, or Alan, depending on how you want to mention that or, or uh, pronounce that. Their work today is often called the critical text or the eclectic text, because eclectic meaning they gather their stuff from all over the place and they try to bring it in. Their text leaves out key words, verses, and passages that we have in our King James Bible, okay? They leave out words, they leave out verses, they leave out passages. Now, they come along and say, well, we have an older text, and there's question about that, by the way, and what we're, what, here's what they say. No, you people who use the King James, you added a bunch of verses. You added a bunch of words. And so you've got this war going on today with Bible translation. By the way, this is the same time frame when Charles Darwin gained notoriety with his book on the origin of the species, promoting evolution. So you have theological liberalism coming up, and at the same time you had, and by the way, it's very much related, the promotion and the popularization of the theory of evolution. Evolution, what does it do? It denies the Genesis account. That's what liberalism does. These two things, they fit together. Here's the point. If a man is a theological liberal, in other words, he does not believe that the Bible is, every word of it, the Word of God, if he is not sound in the faith, I don't want him touching my Bible and come, trying to come up with a new, improved, quote-unquote, translation. Why would any sensible believer put up with such a thing? But that's what's going on. The lost man cannot understand the text to know how it should be interpreted and translated, okay? Listen, the Bible is not just another book. When you take a man who is not born again and you give him, okay, come up with a translation of the Bible, it is impossible for him to come up with an accurate translation. Because he's not born again. He doesn't understand these concepts. It's not just, it's not like, okay, well, I want to put Huck Finn in a different language. We're dealing with the Word of God. And Westcott and Hort, there's serious doubt that these people were true Bible believing Christians. Bible's not just another book, but that is exactly the way Westcott and Hort treated it. And by the way, that is what a lot of Bible translation is today. They treat the Bible just like it's another book. It isn't just another book. It's the book. It's the only book that came from God himself. Even the term, by the way, that field of study, guess what it's called? Think about this now. We're just regular people, right? That field of study is called textual criticism. Let that sink in. They're criticizing the text of Scripture. Well, that's not what they mean by it. Yeah, but isn't that an interesting phrase that they would use? Isn't that an interesting term for their field of study? Even the term textual criticism should make every born-again Christian sit up and take notice. Who am I to be critical of the text of Scripture? My place is to believe it and apply it. Let me tell you something. There's not a person in this room qualified, including myself, to criticize the Word of God. Which leads us to our third point. 
Today, there seems to be a never-ending quest to put together the exact text of Scripture. Folks, this was going on when I was in Bible college, and it's still going on today, and it is going to go on as long as a person does not believe that we have the Word of God in this book, the KJV. It's going to keep going on. What do I mean by that? I mean exactly what I just said. They are continuing to try to put together the exact text of Scripture. They say it is out there somewhere. The exact Scripture is out there somewhere. That's why the text they're using now is called the eclectic text, because they're taking this piece from over here and this one over here, and they keep, okay, let's, let's come up with a new translation. Let's come up with new things. Let's put this together. Let's see what we can do trying to, and some of these people are very sincere, okay? I'm not, I'm not doubting the sincerity of some, but this is what's going on. I got a question. When will you find it? When will you find the Bible? You keep looking for it to put it together. When do you think you're going to find the Bible? If you're looking for it, then what you are saying is you don't have it. So we don't have the Bible? This reminds me of 2 Timothy 3.7, 3.7, where it says, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And by the way, I hope you're seeing how these dots get connected today. This is one reason why there have been hundreds, hundreds of new Bibles that have come to market in the last 100 years. And the acceleration of the numbers of them in the last 50 years is amazing because of improved printing techniques and computerized printing. Each one, if you notice it when a new one comes out, each one promises to be the best, majoring on readability and at the same time, accuracy. So one will come out, this is the best, this is the most accurate, this is based on the critical text of the New Testament, so forth, a couple years later. Well, no, this one now is the best. This is the most accurate, okay? Now, I won't get into the motives on this because that's not my place to judge people's motives for keeping to keep coming out with new Bibles. I'm not going there. I am saying this, though, friends. What does that do? Do you see the devil in the details of this? Oh, I got this new one. Well, how do I know this one's accurate? Can I really believe it? Well, I just got this one. They came out with a new one, and they say, this one's better than the one I just got. Which one am I supposed to use? Do you see the problem? This is a Trojan horse in the church. Whether it is the intention or not, all this does is put doubt on whether what you have in your hands is the Word of God. Why would you build your life on it, take stands on issues, and make important decisions if you are not sure of what God says on the issue? No, I am going with something that has been used and accepted for over 400 years that, by the way, was put together by very brilliant men who were translators. Which leads us to the next point. And for me, listen, if you don't get anything else, get this today. The thought that God was having his church use the wrong Bible until the late 1800s is absolutely ridiculous. But if you believe that the King James is not the Word of God, and you believe that the Word of God was not really found until Westcott and Hoare came on the scene, then what you're saying is that the church for all those years was using the wrong Bible, and God was fine with that. What kind of a crazy idea is that? Do you really believe that? 
Many great churches, missionary endeavors, and lives have been built upon the King James Version of the Bible. The KJV and the underlying text of the Textus Receptus are in harmony with over 95% of the Greek manuscripts and fragments that we have in possession today. That cannot be said for Westcott and Hort. And yet, it's so popular, so well-received, and the King James is so shunned. Do you see a spiritual war going on here? I see it. I'm not into conspiracies, by the way. There are some KJV people out there who are wackos. I'm just letting you know. They've got bizarre ideas, and I'm not one of them. But I want you to think these things through today, folks. These things are important. What does Satan want? He wants to put doubt in our minds that what we have in our hands is the Word of God. And if every couple years you keep revising it and changing it and, and coming out with a new one and all that, then do we ever know that what we have is the Word of God? Can you really totally trust this book? People say, well, most of it's the Bible. Well, now you're a liberal. It's a problem. Matthew 24, verse 35, Jesus said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Did it pass away for 400 years? Well, no, it was just hidden. Wait a minute, are you kidding me? Do you really believe that God would hide his word for 400 years? Until some theological liberals who were into, to some extent, some occult things, came along and they said, no, we've got the better text now. God promises to preserve his word. Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth will pass away. My word shall not pass away. Psalm 19, 9, the fear of the Lord. And by the way, in the context, the fear of the Lord is one of the names of Scripture in Psalm 19. That's one of the names of Scripture, the fear of the Lord. You could, you could say here, the word of God. The fear of the Lord or the word of God is clean, enduring forever. Why would God withhold his word? Why would he give his word and then withhold it and go hide it for all that time? Number five, we believe that the critical text, the eclectic text, the Westcott and Hort text stream corrupts the word of God and cuts important parts out of it. Most everyone... Now listen, most everyone believed those important parts of Scripture were Scripture before the critical text came on the scene. They didn't question those passages. It wasn't until later that those passages were questioned. Okay, Trust me, when you truly examine this, you must be suspect, at least suspect, of anything based on the critical text. Okay, there's some, by the way, there's some good resources out there that I would recommend. I'm not going to talk about them right now because I don't have time to explain them. You won't agree with everything in them, but if you're interested, there are some, I, I believe, good things. Isaiah 40, verse 8, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Except for 400 years when everybody was deceived until Westcott and Hort, our heroes, came on the scene. Forgive me for being sarcastic. You might say, I've never heard any of this stuff. I don't doubt it, but you can check it out, okay? Now, here is something I really want you to see. I can say all these things, but you know what? We're going to look at a few examples of this. Examples of problem passages. Because of the popularity of the New International Version, I will use it for comparison with the King James. Let, re, let me remind you of two things. Again, most people believe what they are holding in their hand is the Word of God. So if they have an NIV, they're going to believe that's the Word of God because that's what they were told when they went to the bookstore to buy it. Remember, 
again, a translation can only be as good as the text that is based on. Now, we're going to cover four areas. I could give you, literally, folks, hundreds of verses. We don't have time for that today. I'll give you some, though. I want you to see them. And what we're going to do on the screen, if this works out right, I'm going to show you the King James, and then right under it, I'm going to show you the NIV. Okay? Now, by the way, what is true of the NIV is true of many, many others as well, such as the ESV and some of the others, okay, and how they're translated. Why? Because those other, most of those other Bibles, not all, but most of them are based on this Westcott and Hort, which I believe is a corrupt text. The first area is a diminishing of the person and work of Jesus Christ. A diminishing of the person and work of Jesus Christ. King James Version, 1 Timothy 3.16 Look at it. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Watch this. God was manifested in the flesh. Do you see that? God was manifested in the flesh. Look at the NIV. Beyond all question, the mystery of godliness is great. He appeared in a body. Where's God? You might say, well, in the context, you know. Here's the thing, though. What they do is they diminish, they diminish, they diminish, they, they change, they take away. They do not honor Jesus Christ as much. Now, I know that the cry is this, yeah, but that's the way it is in the text. Yes, exactly, that's the way it is in that text, that critical text. But that critical text does not honor God like the Textus Receptus that the King James is based on honors God. The question needs to be asked in the NIV in verse 16, who is the he referring to? Doesn't it make more sense to put God? You might say, well, that's just the way the King James people put it. No, they translated it because the word behind God in the Textus Receptus is the Greek word theos, which is the word for God. The critical text probably does not have theos there, probably has he. There's a problem. Now, if you don't believe that Jesus Christ is God, though, you have no problem with that. King James Version, Mark 9, 24. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. The NIV, Mark 9, 24. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Did you catch it? What happened to Lord, which points to the deity of Jesus Christ and who he is? Stripped from the NIV there, okay? Here's, here's, here's a beauty. Titus 1-2, in hope of eternal life, King James, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, NIV, a faith and knowledge resting on the hope of eternal life, which God who does not lie. Do we get it? There's a big difference between cannot lie and does not lie. All of these things, stripping God of who he is, stripping away, it's a dishonor to the person and work of Jesus Christ. Micah 5 verse 2 but thou, Bethlehem Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Are you ready for this? NIV, Micah 5, 2, look at the end of the verse. Whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Ancient times? That's a whole big difference between everlasting. Isn't that interesting? I'm not making this up. There's a big difference between everlasting and ancient times. John, boy, this is one. John 3.13. And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. That is one of the greatest verses proving the deity of Jesus Christ in Scripture. Yet the NIV says, no one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. What happened to 
which is in heaven. It's not there. See, God, Jesus, could be both here and there because he's God. He's everywhere. Do you understand? This is taking away from his deity. How about the way of salvation? John 6, 47, the King James, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. The NIV, I tell you the truth, he who believes has everlasting life. Believes what? Believes what? Believes in simply God? The NIV and related Bibles are confusing at best. Here's one, Acts 8, 36, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. And as they went on their way, they came into a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me from being baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart thou mayest. Do you see that? And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Look at the NIV. And as they continued along the way, they came to some water, and the eunuch exclaimed, See, here is water. What is to hinder me from being, or to hinder my being baptized? Verse 37. It's not there, folks. Literally, it's a blank. The only, if you take verse 37 away, you have the the inference that water baptism is a means of salvation. The King James says, if you believe, okay, the NIV says, no, we're not putting that in. We're not putting that verse there. Are you getting it? Mark 10, 24. Jesus and the rich young ruler talking to him. King James. And the disciples were astonished at his word, but Jesus answered again and said unto them, Children, how hard it is for them that trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. NIV. The disciples were amazed at his word, but Jesus said, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. Do you see the problem? King James, Colossians 1.14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, the NIV, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Forget the blood. Now, what the NIV has, understand, it is translating what it's starting with, which is a corrupt text. The corrupt text does not include these verses, these phrases, etc. So that's why they're not in the NIV, in the ESV, etc. What about eternal security? 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 11. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. We know in studying this in the past, the denial there is the place denying him honor, denying that one. If a believer will not live for Christ, he will be denied honor when he gets to heaven. The passage is very clearly talking about that. And we know that even if you quit believing, you'd still be saved. Why? Because it says the Lord abides faithfully, cannot deny himself. But wait a minute. The NIV comes along and says this. Here's a trustworthy saying. If we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he'll disown us. You lose your salvation. Is it any re- is there any wonder why people think you can lose your salvation today? Do you know why? Because they're reading it in their Bible that's not accurate. It's a Trojan horse. It's wrecking the church. It's wrecking believers. It's confusing people. The NIV says disown. This is heresy. God does not abandon even rebellious children. 
The denial here in the context is a denial of honor and reward in the future. We know once saved, always saved is true. What about the reality of sin in the Christian life? Forgive me, I know I'm going over today. We've got to get to sin. Please continue with me. 1 John 3, 9, King James, it's so accurate. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. For his seed, God's seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. We know the new nature cannot sin. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. That's talking about the new nature in the believer. The NIV, though, translates it this one. No one who is born of God will continue to sin. So if you're saved and you're still sinning, you're not saved. Because his seed remains in him, God's seed remains in him. Look at this. He cannot go on sinning because he's been born of God. See, the NIV says we will not continue to sin, but this is a contradiction to 1 John 1, 5 through 9, and 1 John 2, verse 1, where it says we do continue to sin. Not to mention Romans chapter 7, verses 19, where Paul says that he even practiced sin. He still practiced sin. He, did, he wasn't happy about it, but he did. See, but people read that in the NIV. By the way, in the NASB, New American Standard, which is supposed to be the most accurate based on the critical text, and I don't dispute that, but it says no one who is born of God practices sin. So if you're practicing sin, you might say, what is practicing? It really doesn't matter in anything more than once. If you're practicing sin according to those Bibles, you're not saved. No, the King James gets it right. The King James gets it right, gets it right, gets it right, gets it right. That's why we, that's why we use it. 1 John uh, 3, verse 10, King James, In this the children of God are manifested, the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. Neither he that loveth not his brother. It is clear that the text is saying that when one does what is wrong or hates his brother, this sort of behavior does not have its source in God. What? Absolutely true. It's our old nature. But look at the way the NIV interprets it. This is how we know who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Are you ready, you evil satanic people? Well, well, read what the NIV says. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God. Nor is anyone who does not love his brother. So have you ever done something that's not right? Since you're saved? Oh yeah, well, you're not saved. According to the New International Version, you are not saved if you still do things wrong. Isn't that what it says? Are we wondering, folks, why people are confused today? The King James gets it right. One more. Romans 16, verse 24, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Well, the NIV makes it easy for us. That verse is not there at all. By the way, I can show you passage after passage after passage that are missing from the NIV as well as the other critical text Bibles because what they're starting with is a corrupt text where these things are not there. I know people are going to argue about that. Friend, listen, it just doesn't make any sense. Let us not forget the last part of Mark, chapter 16, verses 9 through 20. John, chapter 7, verses 53 through chapter 8, verse 11. What's the point of all this? Let's wrap this up. What is the point of all this? It is that Satan is using many Bibles today to bring false doctrine into the church. That's the bottom line. He is creating doubt and confusion in the minds of people, especially believers, so that they do not have full confidence in that book they hold in their hand that they say, this is the Word of God. They can't have full confidence in it. And if they do, they end up believing things that are false, and they think they got them from a Bible or from the Bible, but where they got it was from a corruption of the text. Which Bible are we supposed to believe? The more Bibles that come out, the more confusing it will get, 
And the Bible says God is not the author of confusion. It's the devil who questions the Word of God. Let's close in two verses. They're up here on the platform. They'll also be on the screen. Boy, we've covered a lot of ground today. I hope it's made sense. I hope it's made sense. Friends, listen. We want us to have the truth of God. People are confused about this. You know, if you believe the NIV, you can't believe those two verses you're looking at right now. Because the NIV says if you're still sinning, you're not saved. But what does the Bible say? You're saved by grace, not by quitting sinning. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. It is not of works, lest any man should boast. Here we are, this representing our sin. We're all sinners. We're all sinners, including me. God loves us, though, but he hates our sin. For us to go to heaven, we have to be sinless. None of us are sinless. We still sin. Even after we're saved, we still sin. The Bible says if we say, if we say John was talking about himself, saved for over 60 years. He says if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. We're sinners. To get to heaven, you have to be sinless. We are not. God says if we die with our sin, we'll be lost for all eternity, and we will suffer in a literal hell for all eternity. God says, I love you. I want you to live with me in heaven, but you have to be rid of your sin. You have to have a payment for your sin. It has to be gone. Good works will not do it. Look what it says up there. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works. Not of works, lest any man should boast. You can't save yourself. This is why Jesus came. This representing him. God in the flesh. God was manifested in the flesh. Okay? He went to the cross. He took our sin upon himself. He made the complete payment. He died. He came back from the dead. And the Bible says if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you can know you have eternal life. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. He's the only way. So if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as Savior, would you trust him today as your Savior? Okay? Let's all bow in prayer. We thank you, Father, for this day. And friends, with all heads bowed and eyes closed today, if you're here and you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior, I know what we covered today is a weighty issue, and, and maybe it was hard to follow for some. I hope not. I did my very best to try to make it as plain as possible. But this is a big deal. Based on the word of God, though, you can know that you have eternal life if you will trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior. Would you do that today? Will you do that today right where you sit? You can talk to the Lord, get it settled. Lord, the best I know how. I, Lord, I know I'm a sinner, the best I know how. I am putting my faith in Jesus Christ. I'm trusting in him as my Savior. You trust in him, he'll save you. He'll save you. Would you trust in him today? Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. I do pray, Lord, that uh, we will take these things to heart, that we will understand, Lord, this Bible that we use in our church. Um, it is the word of God. We believe it to be the word of God. It's proven itself to be accurate, reliable, trustworthy, and we can believe it to be so. Thank you that you've given it to us. Thank you, Father, that we can build our lives, our eternity, our church, our ministry, our marriages, our families, our workplace. We can build everything upon the truth of Scripture because it is the Word of God. Thank you for this time now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, that concludes this edition of Voice of Assurance. Thanks so much for listening, and would you share this ministry with a friend? To contact us or learn more about our ministry, please visit www.northlandchurch.com. Your prayers and support for this ministry are greatly appreciated. Thank you so much, and God bless you.